So what is enlightenment? We don't have to read very far into Kant's essay before we get his answer to that question. It is the very first sentence of the essay. Enlightenment, he tells us, is man's emergence from self-imposed immaturity. Now, here's the thing about Kant. He demands an active reader. I think the best way to read Kant is when he tells you something, you come up with a follow-up question. And if you ask the right question, Kant is going to go on to answer it. But Kant really wants you to be playing along at home. So, Kant tells us that enlightenment is emergence from self-imposed immaturity. What's immaturity? Well, I'm so glad you asked. The second sentence, of course, tells us immaturity is the inability to use understanding without guidance from another. Now, first of all, notice the strange negative formulations all throughout here. Enlightenment is not entering something, it's emergence from something. And that thing is an inability to do something else without something else. So all of these sort of backwards, we're backing into an idea here. But furthermore, I just have to wonder about the use of this word immaturity. Is this what you mean by immaturity? Why is this word here? Why is the word immaturity here at all? I want you to take another look at these first two sentences. Enlightenment is man's emergence from self-imposed immaturity. Immaturity is the inability to use one's understanding without guidance from another. And so we could just push these two sentences together fairly easily if we wanted to. And we could just say, enlightenment is man's emergence from his self-imposed inability to use his understanding without guidance from another. Now, why break this into two sentences? And if you are going to break it into two sentences, why use this word, immaturity, to break them up? After all, this is not what we usually mean when we talk about immaturity. But what do you mean when you call someone immature? First of all, you're not typically giving someone a compliment. You are typically suggesting that there is something wrong with the way they are behaving or the way they are thinking. And furthermore, to call someone's behavior immature, to call their sense of humor immature, you are suggesting maybe that they're not acting their age. But what does it mean to act your age? You're already suggesting that there are developmental stages that we pass through, that in an earlier stage, certain things are okay, but that by whatever stage you've reached now, you're no longer supposed to be doing whatever it is you're doing, uh, telling fart jokes or uh, letting your mom do your laundry for you or etc. etc. Now, even here, when we use the word immaturity, we are using uh, something of a metaphor. At the core of the concept of maturity is a biological definition. To be mature in the literal core sense is just to be reproductively mature. A plant is mature when it starts producing fruit. Uh, an organism of any kind is mature when it is capable of having offspring. And so it's not just humans that can mature in the biological sense, but when you describe someone's behavior as mature, or when you describe someone's uh, actions as immature, you're drawing on this biological uh, metaphor. And why? Well, I want you to think about how does biological maturity come about? What is it that you have to do in order to become reproductively mature? You don't have to take a sex ed class. You don't have to learn about anything. You don't have to get your heart broken. You don't have to uh, think about anything. This is just something that physically happens to you. And how does it physically happen to you? By nature, all by itself. In other words, this is a process that happens, or at least should happen, automatically. Now, does it always happen automatically? No. What are the reasons that you might not become mature? Well, first of all, there are certain diseases, uh, hormonal deficiencies, nutrition, uh, etc., that might prevent you from going through puberty and maturing. And then, of course, beyond that, uh, let's not forget 
early untimely death. If you die at the age of six, you will never go through uh, puberty. You will never become mature. And so what we have here in the idea of maturity is a process that ought to happen automatically, all by itself, and if it doesn't, it's not just a sign things have gone differently, it is a sign things have gone wrong. And I take it that is at the core of this metaphor that we use when we describe someone's behavior, actions, or sense of humor as immature. We're saying that there's a certain developmental stage you ought to have reached, and if you haven't, it's a sign that something has gone wrong. This concept of maturity therefore has normative content to it. When you call someone immature, you're not just saying that they're acting differently than other people their age. You're suggesting that they are not doing something that they ought to be doing, or that they are doing something that they shouldn't be doing. And this, whether it's acknowledged up front or not, gets carried into the word that Kant uses to break up these two sentences. To suggest that this issue of using your understanding without guidance is a matter of maturing, such that the inability to do it is immaturity. Kant is already suggesting, at least between the lines here, that there are developmental stages that we go through and that we ought to have reached a certain stage, and if we haven't, it is a sign that things have gone wrong. Kant begins this essay with a sign that things have gone wrong. This is going to be a critical account. Now first off, notice that enlightenment is not an individual's emergence from self-imposed immaturity. It's not a man's emergence from self-imposed immaturity. This is man's emergence. This is humankind's emergence. Kant is suggesting, in other words, that humankind is going through a developmental process toward some sort of state of maturity. That if we are immature, this is something we are unable to do. And that if we continue to be immature, again, now we're looking for why has this gone wrong? Kant says, in this case, the immaturity is self-imposed. This is not happening to us through disease or untimely death. We are not being prevented by some external force from thinking for ourselves. We are preventing ourselves from using our own understanding without guidance from another. And so, of course, another follow-up question we have to ask is, well, how is this immaturity being imposed on us by ourselves? And Kant, of course, will answer, laziness and cowardice. What is cowardice? Well, you might say that cowardice is feeling afraid, but that's not exactly right, because if the opposite of cowardice is bravery, you wouldn't say that bravery is not feeling afraid. You can't be brave if you don't feel afraid. And so bravery is the ability to act in the face of fear. So cowardice must be the inability to act in the face of fear. You're a coward, not if you feel afraid, but if you let that fear control you when it shouldn't. Now, of course, what is it that makes us scared? What is it that makes us afraid? You might say that we fear dangerous things, but of course this is not always, strictly speaking, the case. First of all, uh, there are dangerous things that maybe I don't fear. Maybe because I don't even realize that they are dangerous, or maybe just because I am foolhardy or well-trained, like a fireman. However, uh, there are also not dangerous things that I might be very afraid of. Uh, you might be afraid of clowns or uh, little harmless, uh, not poisonous spiders. You might be afraid of birds or thunderstorms, regardless of whether or not they are dangerous. And so it's not that we are afraid of things that are dangerous, but we are afraid of things at least that we treat as dangerous. Uh, again, to think back to Epictetus, it's my judgment that something is bad. So cowardice is going to be something that stops me from acting in the face of something that I think of as scary. 
What is laziness? Laziness, you might say, stops you from doing anything at all, although that's not exactly true, is it? When I'm lazy, I might sit around watching Netflix, or I might sit around reading uh, a novel, or I might sit around uh, reading a comic book. You, on the other hand, may do some or all of those things or different things. If you play video games when you're feeling lazy, for example, I don't really do that simply because, well, for me, playing video games just takes a little bit too much effort and concentration. I kind of suck at video games. But that, of course, might call our attention to it. Why is it that we do different things when we're feeling lazy? Well, because when we're feeling lazy, we seek out things that just don't require much effort. So that's to say, laziness prevents us from doing not specific things, but things that we regard as requiring a lot of effort. Now, if this is the case, then if laziness and cowardice prevent us from using our own understanding without guidance from another, then it must be the case that using our understanding without guidance is something that we regard as scary and difficult. Now this phrase, using one's understanding without guidance from another, is going to get to be cumbersome pretty quickly. So let's see if we can't just give it a, a nice, succinct gloss. And as it turns out, Kant will do that for us. In the final footnote to the second essay you read, what does it mean to orient oneself in thinking? Kant will tell us that the maxim of always thinking for oneself is enlightenment. And so when we're thinking about enlightenment in terms of maturity and in terms of the ability to use your understanding without guidance from another, think about using your understanding without guidance from another as being thinking for yourself. But now this is going to be one of our uh, questions as we go through. What exactly does it mean to think for yourself? This is not going to be a matter of just forming opinions or daydreaming or doing whatever else with your mind. I think the best way to think about thinking in Kant's terms is to think about what Rene Descartes called reasoning. Remember, if you are reasoning, you are looking for the truth. As Kant says, seeking the supreme touchstone of truth in yourself. I don't want to just accept it as true because someone else tells me it's true. I want to know for myself that it's true. That is thinking for yourself. And so using our understanding without guidance from another, thinking for ourselves, this is going to be a matter of not just accepting things as right or wrong on the basis of someone else's say-so, but more than just what Descartes offered us. Kant says rules and formulas are shackles of a permanent immaturity. Now, why? Well, I want you to think about a rule or formula that you might use. If you've been through uh, a good math class, for example, you've probably learned the Pythagorean theorem for finding the length of sides of a right triangle. You might have learned the quadratic formula for discovering the roots of a quadratic equation. Any of these formulas that you use, when you use them, you are plugging in the numbers in order to get the right answer. But my question is, how do you know that the Pythagorean theorem really works? How do you know that the quadratic formula really works? Have you gone in and proven that for yourself? Or when you say it works, do you mean simply that you don't get that marked wrong on the test? Now that's what I thought. And so, rules and formulas shackle us to permanent immaturity, Kant says, because if I use a formula, I am allowing someone else to do my thinking for me. Pythagoras is finding the answer for me. Or my algebra teacher is finding the answer for me. I haven't really thought this through for myself. Now, this is not to say you can't use mathematical formulas, but this is to say if you work through the proof of a formula for yourself, if you see why it works, if you understand how it works, 
you make that formula your own. Now you are doing your own thinking for yourself. You may now be using the quadratic formula or the Pythagorean theorem, but you also understand what you are doing. Now if laziness and cowardice stop me from thinking for myself, if they stop us, mankind, from thinking for ourselves, then it must be the case that mankind, people, regard thinking for themselves as being scary and difficult. Now, you may tell me, well, thinking for yourself is scary and difficult. You might get the wrong answer and bad things happen. Uh, you might have to struggle and you might not always get the right answer. But two things. First, if you've ever had to spend any time with a five or a six-year-old, you'll know that there's just one question they won't shut up about. Why? Why is the sky blue? Why does that man have a beard? Why are we going to the grocery store? Why can't we have ice cream for dinner? Why, 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 why? Now, as we've seen with Aristotle, the question why is a search for understanding, wisdom. I want to understand the cause for myself. In other words, little kids, they really, really want to use their understanding. They really want to think for themselves. Now, of course, children are of limited capacity. They haven't grown up yet. Their brains haven't matured. Again, this developmental stage that we were talking about. And so you would say, well, children can't fully understand these things for themselves, but they really want to. Now, meanwhile, you come back 10 years later, you find that same five or six year old. Now you've got a 15 or a 16 year old who thinks that thinking for themselves is just too much work and scary. Why scary? Well, again, you've said bad things happen when I get the wrong answer. What kind of bad things happen? The world doesn't end, but you might get a bad grade on a test. You might fail the class. You might lose your scholarship. In other words, you might get punished for getting the wrong answer. Now, this is not something that happens coincidentally or accidentally. This is something intentionally done to you. And so Kant says, the guardians who have so benevolently taken over care of us have made sure that we regard thinking for ourselves as being scary and difficult. I think that there are two ways to read this sentence. Certainly, there is the uh, ironic, sarcastic way, right? The guardians who have so benevolently taken over. In other words, uh, politicians, authorities, people who have put themselves in charge now make sure that we are kept ignorant so that they can maintain their power. But I also think that there is a straightforward way of reading this sentence, that there really are guardians who benevolently take over and still keep us immature. I'm thinking about, for example, parents. If your parents love you, they want to step in and do things for you. Your parents don't want to see you struggle. And so your parents might step in and give you the answers or guide you in your use of your understanding or do things for you. And on the one hand, they are doing this out of love. They don't want to see you struggle. On the other hand, though, the more our parents do things for us, the less competence we ourselves develop. If mom and dad are always uh, cooking for you, you never learn to cook for yourself. If mom and dad do your homework for you, you don't learn for yourself. If mom and dad just tell you what to eat, you never learn to make good decisions for yourself. And so I think Kant can be read just straightforwardly here saying that guardians who have benevolently taken over have still ended up keeping us in a state of permanent immaturity. We regard thinking for ourselves to be scary and difficult, both because we get punished when we get the wrong answers and because if other people have done it for us our whole lives, it is now difficult. We just don't know how to do it for ourselves. Now, if this were simply a matter of laziness and cowardice, as Kant seems to suggest, then you would figure that the rest of the essay would be a pep talk. Hey, 
Be courageous. Hey, get off your lazy ass. Hey, I believe in you. You can do it. Uh, Sapper outa, as he puts it in the first paragraph. And yet, that's not what we get from the rest of this essay. That rather, if this laziness and cowardice is self-imposed, we have imposed it on ourselves, Kant's diagnosis is going to lead him to suggest a very different sort of a remedy. It's not going to be a pep talk. There is one thing that Kant says will bring about enlightenment, will bring about the widespread use of our understanding for ourselves. And that one thing, of course, as you've seen, is freedom. Thank you.